Hi, thank you for joining us for Rules of Choice Not This Future. My name is Glog and I'm one of the co-curators for Till We Meet Again in IRL, Best Wishes, Asia Art Activism. A series of uh, online exhibitions, panels, performances, film screenings and radio. Rules of Choice not his future is a performance that facilitates a pseudo shamanic ritual as political device by holding grief as a site of solidarity and communal care directed to the victims of the hostile environments policy brutal border control and neo-colonial global operation not this future is not a show but a space of solidarity and communal care to be present. Please be mindful of this. Uh, this will be uh, an emotionally challenging experience for those whose lived experiences are in and directly related to the Essex 39. So if at any points you feel really tense, uh, you can always pause this video and come back at a later date. Uh, we will be posting some resources, should you need them, and our code of care in the chat box. and. We have people on standby to respond should you need us. Uh, in total, Not This Future is 2 hours and 42 minutes in three parts. Uh, each part is consisting of about 20 minutes video and two intervals of 20 minutes. Thank you.
Święty Księgę Umarłych. Pouczenie o samowyzwoleniu się z bardzo życia. Księga Wielkiego Wyzwolenia z bardzo życia poprzez słuchanie wskazówek jasne ich przypominanie, będąca częścią Księgi Głębokiej Nauki o samowyzwoleniu z władzy bóstw spokojnych oraz gniewnych. Korny i pełen czci pokłon guru i damowi, dakiniom i bogom. Proszę, wyswobódźcie mnie z bardo. Wyżej udzielona została nauka co do wyzwolenia z bardo darmaty. Teraz zaczyna się tekst wyjaśniający bardzo życia. Pominąwszy tych, którzy po wielokroć zapoznawali się z poprzednimi pouczeniami co do bardo darmaty i tych, którzy dobrze są obznajmieni z darmą, ludziom słabo z nią obznajmionym oraz wielkim niegodziwcom trudno jest przyswoić sobie te pouczenia na skutek strachu, lęku i złego karmatu. Dlaczego począwszy od dziesiątego dnia należy przemawiać wyraźnie tymi oto słowy? Składam hołd trzem klejnotom i wzywam pomocy buddów, podwisadków i zanoszę do nich błagania. Potem trzy albo siedmiokrotnie zawołać zmarłego po imieniu i tam tak doń powiedzieć. Szlachetny synu, słuchaj dobrze i zapamiętaj. Postacie z piekła, ze sfery bogów i wszystkie inne pojawiające się w bardo wchodzą w istnienie z mocą iluzji. Gdy w kształtach bóstw dobrotliwych i gniewnych ukazywały ci się one w bardo darmaty, nie potrafiłeś ich rozpoznać. To też po upływie czterech i pół dnia świadomość omdlała w tobie z skutkiem strachu. Ale gdy się ocknąłeś z tego omdlenia i rozjaśniła się ona, pojawiło się przed tobą podobne poprzednie ciało. W tantrach czytamy Cielesne kształty z dawniejszych i przyszłych sfer bytu, wyposażone we wszystkie władze zmysłowe, obdarzone energią będącą dziełem machiny karmicznej z łudy, widziane czystym okiem Boga o tej samej naturze. Tak mówią tantry. Dawniejszy znaczy tu, że oblekasz się w kształt istoty z krwi i kości, jedynie skutkiem mocy twych dawniejszych złych nawyków. W kształtach i proporcjach ta postać świetlista jest podobna do postaci z dobrej kalpy. Dlatego jest to zjawa trwająca przez krótki czas. Zwiemy ją myślnym ciałem bardo. Jeżeli wówczas masz odrodzić się w sferze bogów, pojawiają ci się kształty z dziedziny bogów i tak dalej. Stosownie do miejsca podobnych narodzin, w sferze bytu asurów, ludzi zwierząt i pretów i piekła będą ci się ukazywały zjawy z tych sfer. Dlatego zwiemy je dawniejszymi. Przed upływem czterech i pół dnia pojawiły się za sprawą złych nawyków z poprzedniego życia kształty cieleste z dawniejszej sfery bytu.
How do we mourn in the upside-down city? Who is the we? With the migrants? With the artists? With the contributors to and or witnesses to the horrors of this society? With the people who hold a driver's license? Or we without papers? What does it mean to mourn in and through the differences that have shaped us? Why does mourning take time? There is no time to mourn in the upside down city. We analyze the cause and effect of death in the media reports on our phones. That is not mourning, that is trying to understand better how the unacceptable has become so acceptable. How do you mourn those you don't know intimately? How is it going with mourning the Essex 39 in this upside-down city? Here in East London at the end of 2020. This city today full of viral resentment, identity hatreds moving with peristaltic stupidity. This upside-down city has a crisp tension running through its sinews. It's about to explode. So how do you do it? Do you imagine what these 39 people were like? How they made their friends feel? How they kept their relations? Maybe in these circumstances, one has to imagine perhaps each one of them, their likes and dislikes, what was important in life. Or you see them as a group of 39 people and start imagining their common circumstances. What exploitative labor circuits pushed them out of the nation and drew them together in that lorry? What did they share? Maybe the ocean, maybe the fishing industry, the Formosa steel plant, and the 70 tons of fish that perished. We don't get to see the full picture, yet the unacceptable has become acceptable. As if we could understand their circumstances fully. The images in the media make the mourning incomplete and impossible. Can the spirits move on as everything moves on in the upside down city? How do we organize an act of collective mourning? There are a lot of people involved. Walking into the small space of the Essex 39 memorial, I see a shrine. There are fruits and boudoir biscuits. The incense, the Chinese characters, the 39 names and ages carefully printed in black and white with the photocopier. Three people are already there, a photographer, a filmmaker and a reporter. Typing on the computer, dropping things, taking photos. 
What matters to me is that the powers of people to create and share and practice a counter-memory of the SX-39 become powers to transform the present. And this is the job I do in this upside-down city. As a photographer, I understand why we need to record, bear witness. Maybe sometimes I am perceived as much of an outsider as I perceive them to be. Were they working for Channel 4? BBC? Who do we work for? Where are the spirits? Are we disturbing them right now? Did they give us their consent to be invoked? By us? By any people? Are we invoking them to serve a function or to do something for us? Under the hydrangea, in our once and future garden lies a dead fox. What flowers of resistance will grow from these deaths?
Oh, wow. This house is so beautiful. It looks so Western as well. Your son must be a rich bit kill. Oh, no. No, my son had to work very hard to earn that money. He's not rich. Oh, come on. Bit kill means fortunes and money. What are you talking about? Oh, no. Going abroad no, no longer offers the opportunities it used to for migrants. It's very difficult. And there are so many challenges and risks. I really wouldn't recommend it. Oh, you say that, but if going overseas was so bad, why would people still pay so much to go? Please, could you give me some advice? I want to stay in the UK just for a few years to earn money to pay off my debt and then return to Vietnam. But I don't know what undocumented migrants like me can do and how much can we earn roughly? Thank you. If you want to work in a nail bar, there are shops that employ migrants like you. You can earn about £500 a week. If nobody employs you, you could try dealing drugs or looking after cannabis farms. These are quick money jobs, but dangerous because other gangs would probably cause some mayhem. I applied for asylum three years ago when I was 16. I was put in a social housing accommodation and sent to school. Now I'm 19 and I have a five month old baby. Her father doesn't have any IDs and the home office has rejected my application for asylum. I really don't know what to do and I'm so desperate for your advice. I'm just very anxious because I don't have much time left to make an appeal. It's all the same. Many people come here as asylum seekers that got rejected. So they had to accept the fact that they would stay without any forms of ID. Even the solicitor said he couldn't help you and I don't think anyone else could. You have to accept the risks, nothing's easy. I'm an undocumented migrant and now I want to go back to Vietnam. Do you know if there's any way I could get a free plane ticket from the home office? I can't speak much English so I can't call them to ask. I've been here for 10 years now and my application has just been rejected. In the UK I have no home, no family or IDs and my health is getting worse. I'm feeling really weak now. I'm just afraid that I would faint whilst working. I'm also very unhappy and I just want to go home. Did you read about that organisation? Was it long ago? I wonder whether it's applicable. You could go to the news page for more information. They'll ask for a small grant on your behalf. But why don't you want to go back to Vietnam anyway? Although initially identified as Chinese nationals, it is now believed that all victims are from the neighbouring Vietnamese provinces of Nha An and Ha Tin, both amongst the poorest regions in the country. In 2016, Ha Tin suffered a water pollution disaster affecting over 200 kilometres of coastline, resulting in at least 70 tonnes of dead fish washing up on local shores. It was found that the Ha Tin steel plant, a joint venture between the Taiwanese company Formosa, Chinese Steel Corporation and Japan's JFE Steel have been discharging toxic waste into the ocean, devastating local marine life and directly affecting some 40,000 workers who relied on fishing and tourism for their livelihood. The affected communities have faced crackdowns on protests and are still seeking justice. Today, the region is a hotspot for people smuggling. We can see neo-colonial dynamics playing out here. Big corporations from rich countries come in to exploit resources and low labour costs to produce wealth for themselves. When they cut corners to maximise profit, local working class communities bear the brunt of the fallout, often in the form of irreparable environmental damage. These same countries then benefit from a hyper-exploitable migrant workforce. Taiwan and Japan, for instance, are on the receiving end of Vietnamese labour export programmes. These are effectively systems of debt servitude, whereby migrants work long hours for low pay in often poor conditions in order to send remittances to support their families back home, on top of repaying debts incurred to obtain work abroad. 
In Taiwan, low wages and rampant abuse drive many workers to break away from their contracts and seek criminalised forms of work. In Japan, Vietnamese workers commonly report experience of racism and social exclusion, with many even dying of overwork. This year, we also saw the inclusion of an investor state dispute settlement, ISDS style mechanism, in EU Vietnam trade deals. This effectively gives foreign investors the power to sue host governments when their court rulings, laws, and regulations, many of which serve the public interest, undermine their investments. Globally, ISDS has been used by corporations to sue governments when hard won social and environmental protections negatively impact their production and profits. Currently, two British oil firms are using ISDS to sue the Vietnamese government to avoid paying taxes in the country. With the EU Vietnam trade deal, we can expect European corporations to continue to exploit this mechanism at the expense of the local environment and people who may increasingly seek to build their lives elsewhere. It is in this context that smuggling networks develop and operate. Those seeking the prospect of a better life abroad may hire the services of smugglers who facilitate a legalised movement across borders. Many will incur debts to finance their journeys and expect to undertake difficult work upon arrival at their destination. One response of the UK Home Office is to support IOM, the International Organisation for Migration, both in delivering propaganda campaigns that attempt to deter people from a legalised migration and in criminal investigations aimed at prosecuting smugglers and traffickers. Policies that do nothing to address the conditions that lead people to migrate. Knowing what to say to a close friend who's just lost a loved one can leave us tongue-tied. It's heart-wrenching to witness their pain, especially when the loss is permanent and the person they lost is significant. When offering sports, it's not uncommon to say things like, I'm sorry for your loss but at least he lived a meaningful life. Or it will be okay, time heals all wounds. Every soul shall test death, and traditions guide us to overcome this pain of loss. Quran chapter 94 verse 5 says, For indeed with hardship comes ease. How do you offer words to absence, he says. By breathing them in, I say. The words, he asks. No, the represented presence, I say. Who absented them, he asks. A violent erasure. I say.
of breath, voice and tongue, he says. Of narrative agency, I say. Isn't that the same thing, he asks. Are you asking the absence, I ask. The absented don't respond to words, he says. How do we grieve for the absented? I ask. Wordlessly, he says. How do we grieve for the absented? I ask. There's no syntax for it, he says. But who is offered syntax? I ask. That's not the question we are here for, he says. What questions are we here for, I ask. What comes after words, he says. A rancid bitter tongue, I say. When words run dry, the aftertaste is the offer, he says. And those who don't feel bitter, what do we offer them, I ask. A cup of bitterness and a seat at our table, he says. What does your mother call this? I ask. Ahuasada, he says. Thank you. 
The word immigrant carries all kinds of ideas in its three syllables. It's weighted down by all the meanings it has been given. You know the kinds of things I'm talking about: slow skilled, high skilled, contributor, drawing, cockroach, or just plainly put, simply a concern. Not all of these terms are necessarily negative. But each of them is impersonal, clinical, and cold. It's a slow and accumulative grief without end. There's not one moment that you can pinpoint, but long, enduring grief, and anxiety, that's underness. Đêm trong đen ngồi nhớ lại từng câu chuyện ngày xưa. Mẹ về nước dưới mưa che đàn con nằm ngủ xoa sạch vết con về mẹ ngồi với cơn mưa. Mẹ lội qua. Dưới mưa đêm không ngại, mẹ nhẹ nhàng đưa lối tiên con qua núi đồi. Mẹ chìm trong đêm tối, gió mưa tóc che. Vẫn hy sinh cùng những nỗi sầu và cứ lắm lắm nuôi hai người con mà bây giờ thân mẹ cứ chịu đau. Đêm trong đêm ngồi nhớ mẹ kể về câu chuyện ngày xưa nơi chú trong hầm và phiêu gạo coi tàu hình ỏi ngày mưa cha tôi đã mất trong một vụ tai nạn chẳng thể ở bên cạnh và điều đáng sợ là còn ba mẹ con phải tự nuôi nhau bằng cánh nở. Đôi bàn chân thon bước đi đằng trước vượt qua biết bao nhiêu là gian nan và bản thân con sợ ăn khoai nhưng ta xấu lại cứ khói ăn sang còn chưa ngoan lời mẹ nói còn bỏ bên tai mùa đông mẹ ta con trách kít con áo mẹ mặc kia sách bên vai nhưng ta phải số có ai mua không mẹ tôi đứng ở đây đã bao ngày chiều cơn gió rét và cả đêm đông đi đây đó trên đôi chân hao gầy nhưng lúc con sai đứng trước mặt mẹ thật khó thốt ra câu xin lỗi còn yêu mẹ một từ đơn giản nhưng lại chọn cách im lặng thôi Hồi đang hoang mang, bàn tay mẹ tôi không được bình thường Tránh xa, đáng ra, mẹ tôi xứng đáng được xem như là cánh hoa Tháng qua, đang lỗi trong từng tia nắng Khi trời khi vắng, mẹ vẫn lang thang Để bán vé số thương con khuôn lớn tuổi thở ngày đầu Tôi kém mẹ bắn mà không thể nào thôi lên những tình thơ của mình Nhưng cũng mở đầy màu, và nhiều cũng khó Mẹ tôi đôi thùi chứ đôi chân đang chạy xước Chứ mẹ có phải đừng đầu Như bụng cầu, như lần cầu, cùng đời trôi máu máu Để dịp màu, còn lại gì khi mẹ đau 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 Sức sống mẹ dần yếu không nói được tình thương tại sao mọi người lại đánh trẻ con mẹ của con đâu có được bình thường nằm bất động trên mặt đất rộng tổn thương nặng nề không thể cất giọng à làm sao để mẹ thấy khỏi cuộc đời bất công cô biết ra nhưng đến khi trong đau thương đã bao lâu đi nó bất ngờ đi kêu la phía bên trong em ta 
The earliest human lived within small bands of nomadic foragers, known as hunter-gatherers. Migration of these groups were generally patterned by changing seasons and environmental conditions that affected the availability of food and other resources. Given their nomadic way of life, one might assume these early peoples lacked notions of borders, territoriality, or land ownership. Yet, research on hunter-gatherer groups strongly suggests that these prehistoric humans possessed surprisingly elaborate territorial arrangements. Rather than wandering aimlessly, hunter-gatherer groups likely operated within relatively stable local regional foraging ranges, or what might be best described as networks of foraging sites. These networks were shaped by extended kinship or alliance relationships, religious beliefs, and ecological conditions. Some hunter-gatherer cultures adopted alternative territorial strategies that controlled resources by emphasizing social cohesion and reciprocity. The Kung bands of southern Africa had rather vague borders for their foreign rangers, often coinciding with natural landmarks and made little effort to deny access to other bands. Indeed, resources were not considered to be owned until gathered, and goods were to be shared equally once collected. Bands had considerable freedom to access resources in neighboring ranges, especially with those bands sharing kinship ties. Such visits were frequently, frequent and generally welcome, so long as the visiting group sought permission and shared some portion of the collected resources with a host band. Similar hospitability was expected in return. A comparable system was common among many Aboriginal groups in Australia, where fluid membership and kinship ties also encouraged territorial and resource sharing among adjacent bands. Each band may have had a specific foraging network, but these areas were not considered exclusive and often overlapped with those neighboring groups. During this transformation from feudal to absolutist to territorial nation-states in Europe, Europeans were simultaneously engaged in colonial expansion. As one of the first steps in establishing sovereignty over these new territories, European states began mapping and recognizing them to conform to the territorial state model that was emerging back in Europe. From the European perspective, colonial territories were basically empty lands to be claimed despite the obvious presence of established populations, societies, and governments. The Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494 was one of the first attempts to impose European notions of territor territorial sovereignty beyond Europe. Spain and Portugal, initially the leading colonial powers, hoped to divide all non-European territories amongst themselves and prevent claims by other European countries. After assuming more direct control from the coastly oriented charter companies during the 19th century, European states quickly moved to claim interior parts of Africa. There seemed a real danger that competition could lead to war. So European leaders met at the Berlin Conference in 1884 and 85 to partition Africa. It was through this conference and later negotiations that Europe's leaders largely created Africa's modern political borders. They did so with a limited information about the lands and peoples they were reorganizing and without input from Africans. A similar process was underway across much of Asia.
우리는 국민이 국가에 소속되어 있다는 사실을 최소한 법적으로는 당연시할지도 모릅니다. 하지만 국가는 사법적 보호와 의무의 방식을 보류하고 박탈할 수 있기 때문에 우리 중 누군가를 대단히 어려운 상태로 몰아갈 수 있습니다. 국가는 우리를 어디에도 소속되지 못하게 할 수도 있고 그러한 상태를 반영구적으로 지속시킬 수도 있습니다. 이럴 때 우리는 우울하고 빈곤에 떨어지며 분노에 떨게 됩니다. 추방되었을 때 우리는 권력 외부에 있는 것이 아닙니다. 이러한 추방된 자들의 상황은 자연상태에 놓인 벌거벗은 삶이 아니라 박탈의 조건과 상태를 생산하고 유지하도록 고안된 권력과 강제로 구성된 어떤 조건입니다. 한 집단의 이동이 꼭 구체적으로 이미 설립된 국가에서 형이상학적 유기상태로 옮겨가는 것은 아니라는 말입니다. 주권을 행사하여 헌법이 정한 보호를 정지하고 박탈하는 것은 이러한 이동의 오직 한 측면일 뿐입니다. 이런 식으로 국가의 보호가 중단되면서 발생하는 유기는 다양한 방식으로 일어날 수 있고 이들은 법적인 보호를 받지 못하지만 그렇다고 벌거벗은 삶의 영역에 놓이는 것은 아닙니다. 아무리 극도의 결핍 상태에 놓여 있다 하더라도 벌거벗은 삶으로 귀환하는 사람은 없습니다. 왜냐하면 그 결핍, 박탈, 추방 상황을 만들어내고 유지하는 권력은 분명히 존재하기 때문입니다. 도무지 자신이 어디에 있는지, 앞으로 다른 곳으로 갈수 있을지, 다른 식으로 존재하고 사랑할 방식을 찾을 수 있을지조차 알수 없게 되는 것, 역시 권력이 작동한 결과입니다. 앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞앞
uh, that image yes he will always that image will remain in his mind for the rest of his life yeah and many people were traumatized until now that's uh, that shock will remain for a long time and you you waiting you don't know who will be the next and when that's the trauma that's i don't know if there are any kind of uh, torture worse than that you go to sign every month many times many people i knew they went to sign they never come back <laughs> yeah yes yes ria is like a gestapo yes ria is the only referee is only the founder is only the administrator nowhere to complain yes and if you complain you are gone transfer yeah and they have kind of punishment centers here they know they create that yeah 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 in this system it's like uh, in prison you have uh, you know different category of prisoner they have a santa here uh, it's in points 40 kilometer uh, from limerick my friend is no go area you don't have aids in the forest you don't have neighbor one house only there all time it's group fighting the group blood everywhere even the guys that you call they don't come most of people who stay there more than one year they are gone mentally gone yes that's that yeah and nobody come to do reportage they will say it's a private <laughs> establishment We were told to stand in a queue and wait for instructions, and there on a huge sign above the great block in front of us was the famous Sainsbury slogan, making life taste better. We were sorted into teams. I was told to work in a butchery unit with some of the Eastern Europeans and one Scottish woman. We put on uniforms and caps and were taken across the wet, slippery butchery floor to the unit to join a team of local workers. There was no instruction or training. Within seconds, I was machine cutting pork, learning how to load meat into the cutter by copying my fellow workers. I was told to separate the good meat from the bad meat, which was which. For the second hour, we packaged the cut-up pork, taking it from the vast, stomach-turning mountain of raw meat. For the third hour, we put packages into cover boxes and refrigerated them. It was hard to adjust to the fast pace and the monotony. When your mind can't catch up with the speed of your body, you switch off your mind. It becomes disengaged from your physical being, and you feel your body becoming a cog in a machine. But then time is setting, and you're reminded you're not a cog, but human. I felt drained and stiff from standing in the same position for three hours. I felt sick at the sight and smell of so much blood. The precious half-hour break passed in what felt like ten minutes. It took three minutes to go upstairs and take off our filthy uniforms before being allowed into the canteen. Twenty-seven minutes left. Some of my fellow workers were slumped on chairs, their eyes shut. The Scottish woman was smoking, looking out of the window. She told me she was from Aberdeen and had come south to look for work. I went to the agency like you people did, she said. But I didn't need anyone to lead me into the agency. It's more difficult for you people, isn't it? The bell went. Back to uniform, back to me. And the work got harder. Now we were made to unload large chunks of frozen pork ribs, each weighing about 10 kilograms. I found it hard to manage. We worked non-stop as box after box of ribs were sent to us. The supervisor was nearby, keeping his eye on us. All the workers kept their heads down. During the fifth hour, my feet became numb and I had backache from lifting the heavy ribs. A Polish worker told me they were going to Sainsbury's, Tesco's, Marks and & Spencer and Waitrose. I later found out that Grampian processes 3.6 million pigs a year at this site in Suffolk. We were just a tiny part of this process, each of us no more than a replaceable cog. At 11.30pm the shift finished. We were too tired and cold to talk. We went to the gate to wait for the minibus, the agency minibus, to collect us. It was raining as we stood there, waiting in the dark. Why are they always doing this to us, say one of the Brazilian workers. The agency bastards deduct two pounds a day from our wages for transport, but they're always late. 
Half an hour later, the bus rolled up. Workers were dropped off at various places during the long drive home. We got back to Thetford at 1:30 a.m. I had no strength to take notes. I went back to my mattress and fell asleep. I had earned twenty-eight pounds and forty-two pence. Between 2016 and 2019, Panti Charmi lived and worked in Saganihara City in Japan. It's only just over 30 minutes train ride from a part of Tokyo where I lived and worked in the same years. Charmi was then a technical intern trainee, or Kinoji Shusei. The technical internship training program. Is Japan's temporary guest worker scheme, having been implemented for almost three decades, disguised as a training program to transfer technology and expertise of Japanese industries to neighboring countries. But in fact, it is a way to fill labor shortages of industries such as agriculture, fisheries, manufacturing, construction, and caregiving, with cheap labor of young migrants. The system allows modern-day slavery. Chami was a technical intern trainee at a food processing factory in Sagamihara. While we both were living close to each other, I might have eaten food processed at the factory where she worked. We might have passed by each other in a crowded station, or even sat nearby in a coffee shop. We never had a chance to meet, but existed together. My dream was to open a restaurant of clothes. The name is Sakura. The window is painted with pink and white. This was your dream. In summer 2019, we both left Tokyo and flew back to our hometowns for a few months. And in autumn, we both arrived here in the UK, only a few weeks apart, but through different routes and equally. The route only available to you was very dangerous and inhumane. It took away your dream, future, and life in a refrigerated lorry container before we could finally meet. Chasing dreams and seeking better lives for you and your loved ones are not crime. Judging individual smugglers and lorry drivers isn't enough justice for those who have lost their lives to the UK's hostile environment policies, institutionalized racism, and global capitalism that keeps migrants and blue-collar workers to be disposable labor. Not only here in the West, but also in the East. And in my own home country, Japan. My name is Subash, and I'm a rapper from Singapore. The rights of migrant working class folk who travel to find better lives and better opportunities. These rights are denied almost everywhere as part of globally interconnected systems of racism and exploitation, and we all indirectly benefit from this. Until they have the right to self-organize, the power to self-organize in the places that they move to, we who have relative privilege must actively advocate for them, for their rights to end their exploitation, and very importantly, for their safe passage to these places. They move to to find their better life. This is a poem I wrote about migrant justice in Singapore. It's called Utopia. We live in a system 
that has normalized us to window shop women as ready-made maids and to walk oblivious to a brown man stopped and ID checked because he poses some kind of a threat. And to see overcrowded lorries of sleep deprived of men riding in the back with the equipment. When New Year's wishes are video calls from parents to children they haven't seen in years because they have left their children to raise ours, to build our buildings and fulfill our pleasures in this Southeast Asian utopia. It's six days a week, 12 hour a day shifts for these men of gifts. It's backbreaking labor. Building our marina bays and park colonials and straits clans. We are the new colonialists. They slave away in the heat so you can enjoy your poolside spray tans. They have sweat equity on stolen sand. But this, this is an access card only entrance. Little India is policed ad nauseum. We should have a whole museum in honor of the displaced kings and queens who have literally built this nation, but to us, they are dispensable. One goes, another comes. There will always be a hungry mouth or illusion of grandeur that we will not fulfill, and just because they may be happy here does not make this just. That's why I'm feeling survivor's guilt in the land they built, wondering if spitting this truth in silk is saliva spilt, because who? is going to stand up for Singapore. The first step to justice is recognizing that we are all exploited, albeit to different levels. They are as Singaporean as we because to live in Singapore means to be trapped in a system where we serve to create value for corporations and those in power. We are merely the more valuable cogs. So is this disparity, geographical destiny or calculated cycles of poverty? Wealth is sequestered in a sliver we will never see. We need a value shift in our society where influencers get paid more in loading fees. So I wonder what Channel News Asia ever wanted from me. Is it a quick snapshot of poverty because a single voice cannot end social economic inequality in my country? This is Utopia.
I don't dare ask who you are, selling your strength out on the street. The rich need someone to put up their new houses. They don't care who you are, where you come from. I care. You are the dark alluvial soil, torn from the river bend, the jagged rock, wrenched from the mountain. One difference though, hunger gnaws at your guts. These days, every village must be a great city. Stacks of food shimmer and dance in the street. Not lack of work, but this new life gives birth to new lines of workers. A new sky must mean new kinds of clouds. Dust crawls up the road. The crowd thins out. No one left but you. I recognize you now. The look of quiet tenacity, the scar, the last broken shard of war, 1993. मुझे सर राइट नहीं है बोलने का मैं थर्ड क्लास का एक पुलिस ऑफिसर हूँ थर्ड स्केल का पुलिस ऑफिसर हूँ मुझे बोलने का अधिकार नहीं हिंदुस्तान में खड़े किसी को तो पता होगा मैं कोतवाल हो सकता हूँ पर बोल नहीं सकता हूँ मैं अच्छा कोई तो बता दे सर हमको जरा बता दीजिए जो बोल सकता हूँ बोले नहीं नहीं कौन ये क्या चल रहा है इतना बस बता दीजिए सर बस इतना सब मुझे बता दीजिए मैं मैं क्राइम ब्रांच में हूँ मुझे आई डोंट नो नहीं नहीं मैं बाहर से हूँ नहीं अभी आपने मुझे बोला कि नहीं बॉडी नहीं है क्या है सर बॉडी है कि नहीं है मेरी झूठ What is the shape of your absence? What is the sound of your silence? I can see that a story has been crafted here, out of selected bits and pieces, some fragments of skin, some skeleton puzzles, but I cannot recognize you. It is a scene frozen in time, a carefully arranged pose light design and its shadows, adding drama of sorts. The sutures in your skin are strategically hidden. Here you are become both the archetype and the shadow on the cave wall. A tiger stands for all tigers. A tiger is the tiger. A viper fish is the viper fish. Glass is now where your eyes once were. Did they see the hunter? Did he shoot you from the back? From afar? Catch you in a net? He has slain you for your tusks, for your pelt. He has slain the others for the land, for their daughters, for the riches in your soils. He has taken your carcass, your lives. All the bounty in these halls, all this ivory, all this gold, all these bones. Less than two months ago, I was told by two doctors, one female and one male, that I would have to have breast surgery, and that there was a 60 to 80% chance that the tumor was malignant. In becoming forcibly and essentially aware of my mortality, 
and of what I wished and wanted for my life, however short it might be. Priorities and omissions became strongly etched into a merciless light, and what I most regretted were my silences. Of what had I ever be afraid? To question or to speak as I believed could have meant pain or death. But we all hurt in so many different ways, all the time. And pain will either change or end. Death, on the other hand, is the final silence. And that might be coming quickly now, without regard for wherever, whether I have ever spoken what needed to be said, or had only betrayed myself into small silences while I planned some day to speak, or waited for someone else's words. And I began to recognize a source of power within myself that comes from the knowledge that while it is most desirable not to be afraid, Learning to put fear into a perspective gave me great strength. My silence had not protected me. Your silence will not protect you. But for every real word spoken, for every attempt I had ever made to speak those truths for which I am still seeking, I had made a contact with other women while we examined the words to fit a world in which we all believed bridging our differences. And it was the concern and caring of all these women which gave me strength and enabled me to scrutinize the essentials of my living. And of course I am afraid, because the transformation of silence into language and action is an act of self-revelation, and that always seems fraught with danger. But my daughter, when I told her of our topic and my difficulty with it, said, Tell them about how you, have nev you are never really a whole person if you remain silent, because there's always that one little piece inside you that wants to be spoken out. And if you keep ignoring it, it gets madder and madder, and hotter and hotter. And if you don't speak it out, one day it will just up and punch you in the mouth from the inside. And there are so many silences to be broken. Ojedu Haroban Magunejibe Kamagi Kawak Kawak 울며 세웠소 오늘은 또 몇십리 어디로 갈까 산으로 올라갈까 들로 갈까 오라는 곳이 없어 나는 못 가오 마을 마소 내 집도 정주 곽산 차 가고 배 가는 곳이라오 여보소 공중에 저 기러기 공중엔 길 있어서 잘 가는가 여보소 공중에 저 기러기 열 십자 복판에 내가 섰소 갈래 갈래 갈린 길 길이라도 내게 다이 갈 길은 하나 없소 
I can picture my father in his red checked wool shirt standing atop the rocks above the lake. When he lifts the coffee pot from the stove, the morning bustle stops. We know without being told that it's time to pay attention. He stands at the edge of the camp with a coffee pot in his hands, holding the top in place with a folded pot holder. He pours coffee out to the ground in a thick brown stream. The sunlight catches the flow, stripping it amber and brown and black as it falls to the earth and streams in the cool morning air. With his face to the morning sun, he pours and speaks into the stillness. Here's to the gods of Tahawas. The stream runs down over smooth granite to merge with the lake water as clear and brown as the coffee. I watch it trickle, picking up bits of pale lichen and soaking a tiny clump of moss as it follows a crack to the water's edge. The moss swells with the liquid and unfurls its leaves to the sun. Then, and only then, does he pour out steaming cups of coffee for himself and my mother, who stands at the stove making pancakes. I was pretty sure that no other family began their day like this but I never questioned the source of those words and my father never explained. They were just part of our life among the lakes, but their rhythm made me feel at home and the ceremony drew a circle around my family. By those words, we said, here we are. And I imagined that the land heard us. My mother had her own more pragmatic ritual of respect. The translation of reverence and intention into action. Before we paddled away from any camping place, she made us kids scour the place to be sure that it was spotless. No burnt matchstick, no scrap of paper escaped her notice. And so we did. We also had to leave wood for the next person's fire with tinder and kindling carefully sheltered from rain by a sheet of birch bark. I like to imagine their pleasure, those other paddlers, arriving after dark to find a ready pile of fuel to warm their evening meal. My mother's ceremony connected us to them too. Difficult questions for any people who for centuries have met with derogation of identity. Pride is often born in the place where we refuse to be victims, where we experience our own humanity under pressure, where we understand that we are not the hateful projections of others, but intrinsically ourselves. Where does this take us? It helps us fight for survival, first of all because we know from somewhere we deserve to survive. I am not an inferior life form becomes there is sacred life, energy, plentitude in me and in those like me you are trying to destroy. And if, in the example of others like me, I learn not only survival but the plentitude of life, if I feel linked by a texture of value, history, words, passion to people long dead, 
or whom I've never met. If I celebrate these linkages, is this what I mean by pride? Or am I really talking about love? The word safe has two distinct connotations. One, of a place in which we can draw breath, rest from persecution or harassment, bear witness, lick our wounds, feel compassion and love around us rather than hostility or indifference. The safety of mother's lap for the bullied child, of the battered women's shelter, the door opened to us when we needed a refuge. Safety in this sense implies a place to gather our forces, a place to move from, not a destination. But there's also the safety of armoured and concluded mind, the safety of the barricaded door, which will not open for the beleaguered strangers, the psychotic safety of the underground nuclear bomb shelter, the walled and guarded crime-proof condominium, the safety bought with guns and money at no matter what cost, the safety bought and sold at the cost of shutting up. And this safety comes becomes a dead end in the mind and in the mapping of a life or a collective vision. If I am not for yourself, who will be for me? If I am only for myself, what am I? If not now, when? If not with others, how? So Christmas didn't
Sunset, the sky's all blurred with shades of dusk. A conch blares somewhere, blends with the faint post drum. Back at far havens, fishermen rest their oars, bound for lone hamlets, herd boys tap on horns. Wind sweeps through the woods, birds' wings wear out in flight. Dew falls on roads, the traveller's steps make haste. One stays at home, the other roams the world. To whom confide what chills or warms my heart? Remember the Essex 39. My parents knew what it is to be a refugee, to be dispossessed of your right to be a subject. But they're refugees not because they ever stopped loving their home, but because they loved their children more, because they loved life more. And they clung to the tender hope of a better life, of life itself. How could we ever deprive any human of that hope? We simply cannot. To imagine the world without borders is not to imagine a world where migrants and citizens have equal access to low wage, insecure, poor work. It's not to imagine a world where migrants and citizens have equal access to stingy, heavily surveyed and demeaning benefits. And it's not to imagine a world where we all have access to old age, impoverishment and lack of care. It's to imagine a much better world than that and to believe that a much better world is possible based on the principle that if we share, there is enough to go around. To imagine a world without borders is to imagine a world that is dramatically different from how we live today. It's to imagine a different kind of economy, a different kind of society and a different kind of politics where political debate really does matter and make a difference. It's also to imagine a different kind of social relations between us. A social relation that isn't based on fear, and this is mine, and there is not enough, and I'm not going to share. Now I know that the obvious reply is, well, that's very good for you and your ivory towers in Oxford, but most of us live in the real world. But we need to remember that borders too are a fantasy. I might be utopian, but borders are dystopian. Are we ever really going to have hermetically sealed nation states with those coming in and out are being counted, knowing exactly who's here and who's there? If we think about the tens of thousands of undocumented children born and living their lives in the UK, are we going to just close our eyes and hope that they go away and ignore the injustice and alienation that is growing up amongst us? Are we going to spend billions of taxpayers' pounds deporting them as ever more undocumented children are being born? Is that rational? Is that sensible? Is that really being realistic? We have to remember that borders too are a fantasy and they are a fantasy that sustains inequality. If you kept your eyes closed and took it in, Harlem felt, smelled and even breathed like East London. Hearty, thick, pulsing, home, close and fading. James Baldwin could see his Harlem in the way Dickens arranged words to describe East London. And you, you could see your East London in Baldwin's Harlem the very same way. Everything comes full circle, he said, but perhaps this was the unendingness of poverty. From ends to the hood, did we all love more rigorously, more viciously, more violently, because love was also readying to let go. If tomorrow 
is even less promised to some of us than what of ourselves could we give to today, to ourselves, to each other? How and when would we be amongst the living if now only belong to those who had the safety of being present? Would there be a moment where we would not only be the space we leave behind, but the universes we brought into being? If you keep a people poor and drip feed them, and in return they must prove with their lives and productivity that they are useful and worth keeping fed alive, and then you cut that food line, then it begins to reveal that whiteness does not need to drop bombs or drones to disappear a people. It can cut, cut services, cut access to employment, cut and criminalise, keep our kids in drug economies which criminalise them over food, weed, but never the people who create the demand in the first place. Cut, cut youth centres, cut community centres, cut childhood, cut grass and replace with astroturf, cut earth and sky with single cell apartments, close local markets, close local businesses, close livelihoods, close circuit, circuit television, cut off from food, people and place. He only then turns around to say, look at what these people do to themselves. Cut children, cut children. Inna lillahi wa inna rajun. To the divine we belong and to the divine we return. My father's heartbreaking last question. Which land does he return to? Land that is familiar to him, but foreign to me. Somebody tell me, where does immigrant babas go to rest? Bury me wherever I pass. He passes on land that is foreign to him, but familiar to me. And somehow now I have inherited a piece of land on England, half my father's grave. We, we do not birth anything. We only inherit things. Children, trauma, prayers, unbroken spirit, a tomorrow unlike yesterday, revolution. Mummy, why are all these children coming with boats across the sea and in front of our house? Yes, like your granny when she was your age. Oh, yes. We had to stay outside in the cold and they didn't want them. It happens all the time. But why they don't they care, Mama? Because we adults want to deter as many as possible. But why? Because immigration is a problem. But why? Because adults want to make scary businesses. Ooh, are you selling scary sweets? Yes, sweet guns. Ooh, are they pink for girls and blue for boys? Blue for boys and girls looking after them. Where are all these boys and girls? They walk miles and miles. They're hidden in a van and cramped on a boat in a rough sea. Do they have to pay tickets to come here? Thousands of dollars. Ooh, who gives them? Their mommy and daddy? Most probably. Where do they find them? Selling their land, ask people to lend them. Why don't they stay where they are and buy sweets from the supermarket? Because it is bombed or they're not made there anymore. Ooh, are they going to come and make sweets here then? If they don't die in the way, then they will. So they will work and make us the sweets and send some back as well. Yes, this is the idea. Ooh, this is so sweet, but I have a better idea. Do you? Tell me then. They could have stayed there and we will make sure that they make the sweets there and if they wanted to come here then they could as well. Yes, sweetheart, they could. I dreamt a few years back 
that I was in a supermarket, checking out when I had this dark and luminous and devastating realization in that clear way, not that oh yeah way, that my life would end. I wept in line, watching people go by with their carts, watching the cashier move items over the scanner, feeling such an absolute love for this life and the mundane fact of buying groceries with other people whom I do not know, like all the banalities, would be no more so soon or now, good as now. It's a feeling I've had outside of dreams as well, an acute understanding, looking at a beloved's back as the blankets gather at her waist and the light comes in through the gauzy shades lying across her shoulder watching my mother sleep in her chair, her mouth part open, the skin above her eyes exactly like mine, looking at the line of mourners, tugging the last red fish pepper from the plant. Among the most beautiful things I've ever heard anyone say came from my student, Bethany, talking about her pedagogical aspirations or ethos, how she wanted to be as a teacher, and what she wanted her classroom to be. What if we joined our wildernesses together? Sit with that for a minute, that the body, the life, might carry a wilderness, an unexplored territory, and that yours and mine might somewhere, somehow, meet, might even join And what if the wilderness, perhaps the densest wild in there, thickets, bogs, swamps, uncrossable ravines and rivers, have I made the metaphor clear, is our sorrow? Or, to use Zadie Smith's term, the intolerable. It astonishes me sometimes, no, often, how every person I get to know, everyone, regardless of everything, by which I mean everything, lives with some profound personal sorrow. Brother addicted, mother murdered, dad died in surgery, rejected by their family, cancer came back, evicted, fetus not okay. Everyone, regardless, always, of everything, not to mention the existential sorrow we all might be afflicted with, which is that we and what we love will soon be annihilated, which sounds more dramatic than it might. Let me just say, dead. Is this sorrow of which our impending being no more might be the foundation, the great wilderness? Is sorrow the true wild? And if it is, and if we join them, your wild to mine, what's that? For joining, too, is a kind of annihilation. What if we joined our sorrows, I'm saying? I'm saying, what if that is joy? After hours in the penetrating rain, I was suddenly damp and chilled, and the path back to the cabin is a temptation. I could so easily retreat to tea and dry clothes, but I cannot pull myself away. However alluring the thought of warmth, there is no substitute for standing in the rain to awaken every sense, senses that are muted within four walls, where my attention would be on me instead of all that is more than me. 
inside looking out. I could not bear the loneliness of being dry in a wet world. Here is the rainforest. I don't want to just be a bystander to rain, passive and protected. I want to be part of the downpour, to be soaked along with the dark hummus that squishes underfoot. I wish that I could stand like a shaggy sitter with rain seeping into my bark, that water could dissolve the barrier between us. I want to feel what the siddhas feel and know what they know. If there is a meaning in the past and in the imagined future, it is captured in the moment. When you have all the time in the world, you can spend it not on going somewhere, but on being where you are. I stretch out, close my eyes, and listen to the rain. How we begin this morning in response to what they did yesterday afternoon. I see water all around me. The skies throw it down, wringing out the clouds. The trees shake off their showers like puppies in summer. The fruit I bite, the ripeness oozes down my chin. I wriggle my toes in salt waves, sharp drops dance my skin. I shiver head to tail. My water trembles and leaks stormy down on my face. I clench damp fists. I've been praying. I've been spelling. And these are what my prayers look like, how I've been witching my words. Dear God, dear Gaia, spirits of the air and flame, guardians of the earth and sea, I come from two countries. I come from two mothers, from moving winds across mountain oceans. One is thirsty, another is on fire. All will turn to dust, yet floods will rise. We need a drink. Later that night, between dusk and dawn, under this blue moon, I clasped my heart in my hand, an atlas in my lap. I dipped my fingers in blood and ran my fingers across the whole world. Where does it hurt? It answered. Everywhere. 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 Where can it heal? Everywhere. 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 Where is hope? Everywhere, everywhere, everywhere.
sâu ra nhờ Khi thần xương này mẹ nhọc nhằn hôm mai Thank you. 